Hi, I'm Becky Rose, Dungeon Girl from Pair of Geeks, and today I'm going to show you how to use Incarnate. Now, the reason this has come about is recently I've seen a few maps being put up into the RPG community where geologically impossible things have been put on the map. Now, that's fine in a fantasy game if there's a good reason for it. You know, if you realise what you're doing is magical, but sometimes this has come around from just not knowing any better. So, let's go to Incarnate, and I'll put the link in the description down there-ish somewhere, and we'll build a world. Okay, so, I fired up Incarnate here, and this is what you get. You get this empty sea, and you can't really do anything on it because it's a sea, but we have the Sculpt tool by default, we're adding a circle of size 64. So what I'm going to do here, for this map, I'm just going to cover the world in land rather than sea. And then, so that, that's my starting point. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a coast on, oh I don't know, the west side. Maybe make it a bit sword coast-like. So let's draw that in. So we're removing land now. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to keep reducing this size down to give me more and more fidelity to do the features I want to draw. Now, I don't want uh, too much in, um, you know, to bring it too far away from the edge because I'm not really going to put an awful lot in the edge. But, um, what I'm doing here is I'm doing some estuaries in for some rivers to come out of and now I think I'll just add a bit more over to here so that the map, the map doesn't just arbitrarily end near the, uh, you know, sort of start in the middle somewhere and we go, we'll, we'll use the boundaries that we have and now I'm going to go right down to the smallest size, subtract and do the smarty block fast bits along the very edge of the coast. And this this should enable us to have quite a sort of detailed looking uh, coastline. And I'm just going to cut across there because I'm going to make that an island. There we go. If this is the bit where I ought to fast forward, so just before I do, let me show you how I make an archipelago. I'm just going to squiggle the mouse. Yep, pretty much just squiggling the mouse. So there we go, there's an archipelago. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to create some sort of bits in the archipelago, just, just to make it look a little yes, less uniform, or I'm just going to remove more. There we go. And that is how to do an archipelago. So now I'm going to fast forward until I've got the coastline all done. Ta-da! We have a coastline. Now, the next thing we do with Incarnate is we just put down a background texture. To do that, we go to the paintbrush tool and choose a texture. Now, this is where we can plonk down sort of large geographical features like deserts. Just put that size up. Now, what I've seen a few people do is do deserts like this. So I've got a desert there and I've got a desert there, you know. And, well, that's kind of crazy because deserts generally follow the equator that's exposed to the sun more. And if you've only got one sun in your fantasy world, it's pretty much going to go around the equator provided your world sort of spins along that axis. So that's where your deserts are going to be. That's just, just end up, unless you've got more than one sun. So how do we make this work, having a desert up here and a desert here? Well, we have more than one sun. So let's chuck that desert in, and then let's make this a little bit smaller. So I'll just take it out for the moment. Back to my desert texture, bring the size down, and we'll have a second, much smaller sun that passes over the world in consistent stripes. There we go. So, uh, there we are. Now we've got our desert shape. 
So uh, I'm going to put in the the sort of the temperate colour as well. And obviously that texture is just a bit too sort of bold and solid, so we can mix that up a bit by adding some alternating textures. Let's go back to our map, and what I'm going to do is I'm just going to pick a sort of an alternative grass colour, very close to the original, and just sort of scattering some down, just to give it a bit of depth. There we go. So, uh, unfortunately Incarnate doesn't really have a colour that's close to the desert, I suppose. Yeah, a little, but it just kind of feels a bit too harsh to me, so uh, I'm not going to do that. Um, what I think I am going to do instead is I'm going to make the desert just a bit smaller, so that it's not so dominant on the map, just because it doesn't have that nice uh, sort of texturing effect. Okay. And in fact, it's going to shrink a little bit as I draw the rest of the map as well. So the next thing people usually place down is mountains, and we find them on the forest tool, oddly enough. And then in the forest tool, we can choose a pattern. So here's the mountains one. Let's close that tool off. And there we go, we get these nice sort of dramatic looking mountains. Now we can change the size of these, so I can have a really big couple of mountains right here. And then as we get further away from that, reduce them. Now mountains, because they are formed by, usually by tectonic plate movements, they tend to run in a crack up the land rather than in sort of circular patches. It's usually a, a line up the map, or, or sideways, you know, wherever your tectonic plates are. Curl my brown, there we go. Similar thing here. Just mixing up the size a little bit. There we go. So uh, I think we'll just scatter a few more around there. And then, of course, next to mountains, you generally get foothills. more around now mountains also uh, sometimes not usually as big but you can sometimes find them near coasts and with the incarnate tool here we can just delete a mountain if we're just not happy with the placement if it's just sort of gone just into the water or something just remove that mountain Now, wherever you find mountains, you will find the sources of rivers. Now, at the mountain stage, they're usually quite narrow and passable and shallow. And as they get closer and closer to the coast, they'll get bigger as more and more water and, and river sources accumulate into those rivers. So, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to make some valleys into these mountains. and now I should have a nice spot to have a river valley coming out of these mountains. Now, important note, I've seen a few maps recently where water has looped around a mountain range or uh, sort of got a bit sort of close to the mountains. The thing is, water doesn't flow uphill. I mean, apart from when a man wakes up with morning wood and goes to the loo. Other than that, water doesn't flow uphill. It goes down. Uh, that's its path of least resistance. So try not to take a mountain from one mountain range up to another because the map only shows the noticeable hills. The ground will be undulating throughout. So don't take a map, don't take a river from one mountain source too close to another. But what you can do is have the rivers draining off, in this case, the east side of this river and joining another river. And at the point it joins, that river gets bigger. Ah, 
Uh, you could also maybe have a little lake. Now, I appreciate I've drawn this in the desert, but we'll fix that in a moment. So here we go, we've got a bit of a lake here. And let's add another water source to this lake. From here, because there should be a fair amount of water coming off these mountains. And in fact, we'll have some coming out of this hill as well. So there we go, these rivers have joined together. And in fact, I'm going to make that a bit bigger. There we go. So this narrower stretch of water can only happen if the rock around it is quite hard. There's got to be a reason for that. Uh, it will mean the water is faster flowing. And that reason, of course, is because of hills or a change in the rock of some description. So I'm just going to move these in. There we go. So. Now we've got rivers that are merging, but also rivers sometimes split. So let's have that on our map as well. Uh, by splitting this water source over here. Bringing it all the way down to here. And then add some more rivers from here, maybe here, which of course means at this point the river is going to be quite wide. So we'll draw that down there. Um, so at this point we've got quite a, quite a nice sort of complex water system forming here. So. Uh, We've got to do the same over the East Coast, so I'm just going to pause the video again and I will rejoin you in a moment. So what you'll notice here is that all of my rivers are leading away from the cracks in the mountain. You know, that, that tectonic plate that pushed together, my rivers lead away from it. So that's a fairly typical pattern. Um, we've got something of a, a network, a maze of rivers. In fact, this, this sort of mass here, this is almost an island. And that's perfectly fine. Uh, makes it very difficult to access. And it could mean that any bridge in this area is strategically really important. So when we add our bridges in a bit, I'll make a note of that. So these rivers going through the desert, well, you can get that. The Nile is a case in point. But generally speaking, what that will do is it will mean you, you get this sort of um, land near the river that is arable. So I'm just going to allow that river to sort of cast this, this sort of alternative landscape of, through the desert. And I'll, I'll patch that up in a moment with the secondary colour as well. in the desert there. I didn't know when I started this map that I would get an oasis, but it's just become a, a thing on the map, just naturally from the, the geology. So let's, let's make that the next thing we turn our attention to. Okay, so we know we've got an oasis here, and we know that whatever bridge is here is strategically important. So what better place to have one than near here, near this oasis. But at the same time, is this river too big to, to cross? Maybe we've got a string of small of bridges over the smaller rivers here. So let's zoom in on this section and get to work. So first thing I'm going to do is place the actual bridges. So let's get our, our bridges in. using the object tool here to just grab some bridges and just plonk them down. So 
So that's got to make whatever settlement is here really important. And with this landmass being, this one here being probably the most significant in terms of access to this lake and the, the settlements beyond, I would suggest that this is the best place for the settlement. So let's go place that down now. There's just no way that there wouldn't be a big walled settlement right here. Oh, I accidentally placed another one. Ah, computer use 101. Okay, let's zoom that back out. So there we go, we've got our first key strategically important location. Um, now, another place where uh, really important, um, prominent cities could pop up is where there's a good place for a port. And for that, we're looking for water that isn't rocky, that has good access to the outside world. Along this coast, we've got mountains, we've got islands. This is difficult water to navigate. So it's quite likely, therefore, that we're going to have a port perhaps here, I think, looking at this. It's the most navigable port. Um, so I, I think this is a really good spot for a city. So I'm going to place our second really strategically important city down. And of course, because these are strategically important cities, I'm going for the, the, the walled city, the citadel. And I'm going to make this one quite a large one because its trade would mean it uh, has prospered. So I'm going to make it a walled city and plot that right there, a fair size there. Okay, so, I'll just come out of that tool, there we go. So now we've got two really important prominent cities on this map that both have big walls. So now, what else is here? Now the temptation for most map builders will be to look at that mountain range dividing the middle of the map, the vertical slice across the map, and on one side of the mountains have one culture, and on another side of the mountains have a completely different culture, a nation that could be at war. And the thing is, nations and empires quite often do build geographically, but not really according to mountain ranges as a rule. You see, empires expand based on their technology, uh, as odd as it sounds, and their ability to use the land. So an empire which forms in highlands has usually got like, farming techniques and, and is able to use the resources of a mountain range throughout. So there is some truth to that conventional way of thinking about empires. But when you look at empires on a larger scale, when they begin to, to grow, they usually grow along the same temperate region. So if you've got uh, an empire in the desert, it will usually stay in the desert. If you've got an empire in a temperate region, it will expand across temperate regions. It explains a lot about how European colonization expanded, and also the Mongolian Empire. You know, why did they go west, not east, from their, their point of origin? Well, their ability to use the land was based upon the type of land that they were on. So, in our map, it makes sense that whoever controls this city, this sort of temperate region but near the desert, is probably also the same empire as this, but they're probably also going to have built a city here at some point as they tried to expand. And sure enough, maybe a, another empire has come along in the meantime and built across this mountain range. Um, expanded their empire, and as this empire was uh, grew, this became cut off. And then as whatever empire was on this mountain range rescinded in power, maybe trade links re-established, but what you've got here now is a, is a city that's independent from these, but culturally quite similar. So on that basis, I think what we'll have is a city of a, of a similar culture, we'll just bring that size down a bit and put them right there. Now, in the history of this part of the world, this would have once been founded by the people from this port city. 
but got cut off and now trade has re-established. So how does that trade get through? Do they go over the mountains, a dangerous mountain route, or do they navigate round? Well, there's a good choice for, for any adventure that involves travel between the two. Do you go up and round the safe route or do you take the fast route through the mountains and over a crossing on this river here? So let's put a river crossing in. So now that we've got that crossing in, it makes sense also that these people who are part of the same empire or the same country as this larger city up here, they're also going to need to get there. And what's the easiest place to build a bridge? will be just here. And just plug it there and move it. And here. So now we've got these obvious bridge locations. So what we've got here then must be a road leading through. And to do this, I usually paint it. And for this, I'm going to bring the softness quite a long way down. So if I, if I just increase the size for a moment so you can see it more easily, the, the softness gadget reduces the edge of the circle that we're drawing. So I'm going to bring it down quite a long way, bring that size down, and then let's draw the road between locations. Now the road should naturally follow the river. That's where it's safest where the land is better, where it's easier to live off the land, you can live off the river as you're travelling, and then we'll cross the river here, we'll go through around the highlands, this is the highland pass. Now, crossing this desert, there's not going to be a road across the desert, it wouldn't make sense, the path is naturally going to end here. Uh, we will, however, just quickly draw in this road here, and then perhaps the other side from this mountain, maybe the path picks up again to head to whatever's down to the south. And then going east through the mountains, well, what's the best route through the mountains? Probably these smaller mountains just here. So we'll have a road going into the mountains, and then a road coming out the other side, but through the mountains you've just got to follow that pass and just hope you don't get ambushed by whatever lives there. So from the geography we have derived some natural places for cities to appear, natural places to have put bridges and roads and some limitations on those roads. That means that sometimes a road appears to go to nowhere but that's fine, that's because the desert crossing is just something you just have to stock up and go for it. And this is a natural place for caravans to form to cross the desert together for protection. So if a caravan is going to form, that means you're going to get settlements appear for a period of time. So let's take a look. It's caravans forming here, easy and obvious enough, they do so in the city, but how do they do it here? There's a need for a settlement here. So let's put one in. And we'll make it a small settlement, just a little village here shrink this to the smallest possible size, and there we go, a natural place for this village to, to be, for the caravans to form and to head across the desert. Maybe half the buildings in this village are temporary, that they're sort of built by the merchants as they wait for enough people to form to then cross this dangerous desert together. We have the same thing at this end of, of the road as well for those travelling north. It's a smaller, safer crossing, but still it's it's not one you're going to want to do alone or in very small groups. So we'll put a village in here, but wait a minute, there's no water supply, no natural water supply for this village. So it's not the right place for it. Instead, it's more likely to be here in the shadow of this mountain. So now, when travelling from the south, merchants will get as far as this village head up the road and eventually the road peters out at this peak and then you've just got to make that last dash across the desert together. So here we've got caravans forming in temperate regions that would should be quite safe in theory. But there's a reason for them being there. Our geography has shaped the behaviour of the people in the world. 
natural resources can also have a huge impact on the world. And people will often do otherwise quite dangerous things just to get a valuable resource. So for these people, perhaps in amongst all these archipelagos is particularly rich fishing, maybe kelp villages or, or kelp farming or, or, or so forth, or, or some other, you know, maybe lobsters, whatever is in that water. Um, and that good resource means people want to live near it in order to make the most of it. So for this, I'm going to put a town in just here. So now we've got this town harvesting this resource. How does this town connect to the outside world? Who needs that resource? Well, the obvious answer is this city. But this river is too wide to cross here. So in order for the kelp to, to get through, either they've got to sail around these really dangerous rocky waters, and maybe some people do do that, or we've got to go the overland route. So let's paint that in. So here we have a road Again, following the river, because that's the most logical, safest place for it. But where are we going to connect it to? For expedience, we're probably going to have a crossing point on this lake. It's the most sensible thing to do, to have a small settlement here, and something at the other end of the lake, maybe just a, a dock of some description. So. Let's put down our village, first of all, on one end of the lake. And then at the other end, we're going to put in a dock. There we go. So now we've got Lake Town, and a very good reason for it. Now earlier on, we mentioned that there was an empire that rise and, or, or rose and, and fell in this mountain range. Some other, it's a fantasy world, so uh, some other creature, maybe orcs or goblins. Where are they now? Well, they're probably still there, just uh, their, their, their massive strength has, has maybe waned with, with the resources of the mountain um, being in decline, weather changing and so on. So, let's put in their citadel where they are now mostly contained, and we'll put that, I think, in the shadow of this giant mountain, because it's nice and dramatic and fantasy. But these aren't the people that want to cross the river, they, they, they farm their existence from this, this mountain range, so they're not going to give them any crossing points, that would be just exposing a weakness to them, allowing people to get in. But that wall, although this is now a uh, a remnant of this once great empire, there will be traces of the war and of the defences that were built during that time. So maybe this bridge has a tower to protect it. Uh, perhaps these have a, a forward tower up in this hill to protect these ranges. So we'll put that in too. Uh, this city may have had a forward defence on the other end of the road. And Maybe there's a ruin or two, a city that once was. Perhaps it's an orcish town. And another down here. And maybe we'll just have that one somewhat larger as well. The old capital, as it were. For good measure, chuck down a compass. Put a boat in the sea, just because maps do that. Probably not best on a trading link. There we go. And... Yeah, why not? A squid in the ocean. Okay. So, now we've got a world, we've got a little bit of history. We've got another civilization. So, our map's coming together, right? Let's make that citadel bigger. But... These orcs, sure, they're, they're, they were once beaten in a war that drew them out the northern reaches of the mountain. Maybe that isolated small pockets that have now banded together to form small towns. 
so let's find a little orc town, make it a bit smaller, and up here in the north we've got an orc town. Let me just zoom in, make sure that icon's visible. That's not great placement, is it? <laughs> okay. Stop that. Let's move it. Push to front, there we go. Let's put it on the eastern slopes. And then just in front of that, we're just going to. Okay, there, there we go, that, that should be sufficient. Okay, so. Now we've got some isolated orcs that are now separated from this tribe down here in the south where their capital per se is. We've got our reconnected city, we've got our dangerous mountain pass with all of the defences that guard it, and we've got the dangerous route around the north, but now, oh, now that route, that easy route around the north, maybe it's not a road that's taken anymore because of this orc town to the north. Maybe that's an adventure for your players. So now I'm just going to sprinkle on, oh wait. So the next thing to add of course is trees, because forests happen. Incarnate gives us a couple of tree options. We have pine trees that are usually found in, in the northern hemisphere, and they do like altitude well. We've got these, this sort of generic evergreen tree, and then we have these dead trees. So let's do something with that. Let's have, uh, first of all, I think it's reasonable that these hills would have a fair amount of trees around. So I'm just going to scatter them in amongst the hills and the mountains. Just to add a little bit of variety and depth into that map. There we go, just, just, to, just for art purposes. Now, we can also do forests and we can, much like everything else in Incarnate, we can rescale them. So this is a fantasy world. Let's have a big tree, a magical fantasy tree. Let's bonk it there. Oh, no, that one is chosen. Let's keep going until we get, there we go. There's one I like. So I'm just going to delete those two. And move this one. Oh. Doesn't let me move it. What a shame. Okay, I'll just have it there. There we go. So this magical fantasy tree of life uh, maybe has mythical properties. Actually, I really do want to move that. Let's let's put it somewhere new on the map. Let's have it over here. So we'll just keep placing until we get a nice graphic for it. There we go. And then delete the others. So this gigantic tree has life-giving properties to whoever lives around it. Yeah, it's just a random idea I had whilst drawing the map, um, but let's make something of it. So uh, what have we got here? Let's say that once something lived here, once there was a town, in distant memory maybe of uh, uh, peoples long forgotten, so some ruins that surround it, and now it is home to a fearsome dragon, a big, oops, a big one. He lives amongst the ruins and harvests the magical energy of this strange life-giving tree, enabling the dragon to live forever. Now we'll just chuck down some forests because, you know, why not? Uh, forests tend to like places that are wet, so don't forget to make sure that they uh, go near your rivers. At the same time, I don't want to hide my road, so I just peter the forests out when they're quite close. 
uh, and where I go over, that's okay. Just don't completely swallow the whole road. So just leave enough there to know that the road continues. And just chuck a couple of odd trees there. There we go. It's a nice forested area around the lake. Now obviously these trees are good at retaining moisture in the soil, so that's going to have an impact on this desert land, this desert texture. So that will enable us to remove some of that desert texture. Now nearer a city, a lot of these woods will have been cut, so maybe this was once a big forest, but it's now just patches of trees. Much like there's a tree of life, maybe over here we have a dead forest, one where the spirits still walk within. You definitely don't want to take this route round the north now anymore, do you? Maybe, maybe this is the only remaining safe passage through, and it's subject to frequent orc raids still. Uh, perhaps these orcs here in the north and the south have diverged so much that in the south you've got green orcs, in the north you've got red orcs. You see, when you're drawing the map, this is your home for inspiration for not just what's going on in the world now, but what has happened previously. Your maps are an opportunity to introduce history into the game and reasons. What we've created at the end of this is a pretty looking map, I'd better save, <laughs> is a pretty looking map uh, that has depth to it, that the, the roads, there's a reason that there's a road that, that just ends at this mountain. There's uh, a reason for having red orcs in the north and green orcs in the south. They diverged at the end of whatever war it was, however many hundreds of years ago. It doesn't matter, history won't record it in that greater detail, but there is a reason that the players can discover, or even that the characters in the game might already know, that you can narrate as you explain the world to the players as they're introduced to it. Lastly, of course, you can caption your world, give places names and so forth. That's easy enough to do, I'm sure. You can figure that out for yourself if you don't already know. So, that was Incarnate. And, well, a few tips from me on building your worlds. Um, I hope you enjoy it. And, yeah, go using incarnate.com. It's a great bit of software for somebody as unskilled as... That was my phone. So, <laughs> uh, for somebody as unskilled as me to build a... I haven't got to pick some up, have I? No, 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 it's all good. That just totally threw me. Right. Um, go. Where was I? Incarnate is a great tool if you've not got much skill to just throw ideas visually down and have something that looks half decent come back. They, they, I think I believe they're working on new icon sets and iconography so you, you get new stuff. It's already evolved a lot just in the time that I've been using it. And I'm really happy with the results it gives me and I don't have to worry too much about my ability to draw. Um, just one thing I think I forgot to do was, was the impact that the, uh, the trees would have on the soil. So if we just go back, we, we correct that. Uh, maybe we'll, we'll, we'll chuck this down um, a bit more size and uh, increase the softness back up to full. So we just patch around that. Uh, anywhere I put trees too close to desert, just to show how the trees have recovered the, the just to go my road. No, yeah, never mind. It's not sufficiently bad that it would cause, cause a problem. So 
Yeah, you know, I mean, it, it, it's a great tool, and hopefully the tips I've given in, in as I've built this will be uh, stuff you'll find useful in building your own world. So just avoid some of the, the uh, schoolboy errors, as it were, that I've seen on some of the maps I've seen in recent times. So, um, at the end of the day, though, it's a fantasy world. You can create your own rules for it. You don't have to adhere to geology and geography or anything else if you don't want to. It's fantasy. Some things can be there just because magic. But if you want to add that sense of realism, hopefully some of the tips I've given might help you in that. Um, and maybe you've got your own tips that you could share with other people. If so, in the comments, please share them. And um, I'd love to hear them. So uh, that's it from me. Becky Rose Dungeon Girl, this is Pair of Geeks, a Turah.